Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Cooley. I am the Targeted Outreach Director for the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Um, this is the Applying for Student Debt Relief webinar um, hosted by the DFPI. Um, we will get started a little shortly here. I know it's a little bit afternoon. Um, I know that it's about lunchtime. Again, thank you uh, for taking the time to join our webinar. Uh, let's give everyone just another minute to jump in, okay? We'll get start started shortly. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. Again, I want to say hello and welcome. Thank you for joining our webinar. My name, again, is Cooley. I am the Targeted Outreach Director for the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. I do want to introduce uh, one of my panelists. Um, her name is Selena Damien. She is the DFPI's Student Loan Servicing OBUDS person. Selena? Thank you, Koo. Um, as I said, my name is Selena Damien. I am the Student Loan Servicing Ombuds person here at the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Um, it is my pleasure to be here today to share this important information with you. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. All right, let's go ahead and jump in. A lot of really great, important information. Um, first of all, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and your microphones and video and chat has been disabled. Uh, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to submit them into the Zoom's Q&A feature. We will be answering, I have a team of uh, specialists who will be answering your questions as we go along. We also will be dedicating about 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer uh, as many questions as we can. Um, also, uh, this webinar, as it's being recorded, we will send out an email, um, a link to the, the recording and uh, the a copy of the slides to everyone who registered for the email. So look out for that coming later today. Uh, finally, <clears throat> um, you know, the student loan world is constantly changing. Um, as of right now, all the information presented in this webinar is accurate. Things may change later on, but right now, what we are presenting right now is the most accurate information. Okay, let's go ahead and get jump, uh, jump right into it. Selena, do you want to talk about the DFP? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so just a little bit of, about who we are. Uh, DFPI is California's Consumer Protection Agency. And in 2020, under the, the state of California signed the consumer California Consumer Protection Law, which expanded our authority to oversee previously unregulated providers of financial products, which included student loan servicing, servicers. So now we have the authority to license and examine companies of financial, these financial products. We accept and investigate consumer complaints. We take legal action when companies are not in compliance and conduct education and outreach such as this one to enhance consumer awareness and to protect consumers from fraud and abuse. Next, please. Uh, student borrowers do have some uh, protections or rights that are on the federal level that are determined by the Higher Education Act of 1965. However, there has been a historical lack of um, oversight of the administration of federal student loan programs 
and borrowers have been left with uh, facing uh, and navigating an unregulated complex system. Therefore, in uh, the year in 2019, California introduced the California Student Borrower Bill of Rights, was introduced as Assembly Bill 376, and it is a protection that is only available here in California, and it applies to student loan servicers doing business in California, including state licensed servicers, as well as banks doing servicing. It applies to borrowers with both federal and private loans. And as I said, California is only one of 13 states that has such established advanced legislation to protect borrowers. Prior to the Bill of Rights, borrowers, uh, servicers were found to routinely lose paperwork and misapply payments um, and causing borrowers to slide into default. Um, what this bill does, what this protection does, is it prohibits servicers from engaging in abusive, unfair, or deceptive practices, and it requires that servicers work in the best interests of borrowers and that they provide accurate information to avoid delinquency and default. It establishes special protections for military borrowers, borrowers in public service, older borrowers, and those with disabilities. It also established my position, the ombudsperson position, um, and one of my most important duties is to work directly with student borrowers and help them understand their options and their rights. One other important provision of the uh, Bill of Rights is that the servicers are required to answer all of borrowers and qualifying written request or any request for information within 30 days. And that's very important, especially right now with all the changes that are going on. Um, now I will hand it back to Ku so he can uh, start with our updates. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Um, okay, so I'm gonna say, some of you might be busy and you can only watch a couple of minutes of the web webinar. Listen, key takeaway from this webinar, the student debt relief application is available and you want to apply today or as soon as you can. Um, here's a link directly to the application. Um, it was made available, I wanna say uh, last week and the deadline to apply I know is next year, December 31st, 2023, but that doesn't mean you need to wait. You, the sooner you apply, the sooner you could get debt relief um, and you could get into the list of having your application processed. Um, the application takes less than five minutes. It's also available in either English and Spanish, which we're going to go through here in a minute. Um, and a paper application is coming soon. So key takeaway, apply now. You're going to hear this a lot throughout this webinar. Okay. Uh, I know that there are, and I'm going to address the the you know the 900 pound uh, gorilla or, or uh, animal in the room. Listen, even though there are a lot of lawsuits that are um, have been submitted against the debt relief, and we have a list of them here. Um, if you want to read more about it, the U.S. Department of Education is still accepting applications. So take action, apply today. That's what we're. That's what we want you to do. Um, whatever happens, it's not going to hurt you one way or the other. Just submit your information if you're eligible. Okay. So uh, some details about the student debt relief um, plan. First of all, um, the type of loan you need uh, is only the only loans that are eligible are federal learn, loans, and the loans must be dispersed on or before June 30th of this year. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means that if you're a student going to school and your loan was dispersed uh, at the beginning of the semester, something like August, September, that loan will not be qualified for student debt relief. However, if you have any loans that were dispersed before June 30th, it will be eligible for student debt relief, okay? Again, the federal loans uh, that are eligible are direct loans, um, federal family education loans, also known as FEL loans, but they have to be held by the edu education department um, or are in default. Also, uh, federal Perkin loans that, Perkins loans that are held by the education department, um, any kind of defaulted loans. Um, and then this is a little bit, this is, gets a little into the weeds here. Um, direct consolidated loans are eligible. So all loans that were consolidated um, and that are ED held and ha they were dispersed before June 30th, right? So um, there's certain scenarios where you might have a bunch of loans you consolidated, including a loan that you that got dispersed, let's say in August, um, that consolidated loan would not be qualified for debt relief. Also any uh, Fell or Perkins loans not held by the um, ED 
uh, are eligible as long as the borrower applied for consolidation before September 29th of this year. Okay. Um, it's a, it's kind of these little side notes and technical technicalities, um, but we wanted to include it here just to kind of clear up a little bit of confusion. Also, private loans are not eligible um, for the student debt relief. And if you really want to find out what kind of student debt a uh, student loan you have, the best place to go is studentaid.gov. Um, just log in. It'll have the different type of loans you have, um, the history of it, all the different details. Again, go to studentaid.gov, log in, and check out your loan, uh, your loan details there. Okay. The other requirements of the student debt relief is um, your income from 2020 or 2021. It's going to be, should be on your 1040 IRS form. Uh, we literally took this screenshot from the studentaid.gov website. Um, basically speaking, anybody who is single, who is making $125,000 or under, or if you're married uh, or filing, you know, uh, married and filing jointly, making $250,000 or below is qualified. Again, there are right there in the chart, it talks about the different uh, possibilities that might be um, that might that you might be qualified for. Um, the other question we get a lot is what is AGI, right? So, you know, these, what your income is based on is your AGI adjusted gross income, uh, which can be found on line 11 of IRS form 1040. It's just basically your gross income minus your adjusted income. Uh, it's a question we get a lot about, you know, do, do I qualify based on my AGI? AGI is adjusted gross income. Okay. So let's say you have the correct loan type and let's say you meet the income requirements. Um, how much do you qualify for, right? Well, the amount of debt forgiven depends if the borrower received a Pell Grant in college. So if you received a Pell Grant at any time, in your college career, so freshman year, senior, it doesn't matter. Any semester or at any point in time you were given a Pell Grant, you are qualified for up to twenty thousand dollars, up to twenty thousand dollars of a student debt relief. Um, if you never received a Pell Grant, um, then you're only qualified for up to ten thousand uh, dollars of student debt relief. Um, we have a little more technical information about Parent PLUS loans. Uh, next slide. But I do want to say that if you, and we get a lot of questions about this, um, if you have less than, let's say, $10,000 in debt, um, you know, can you get extra money from this? You can't. No. Basically, the student debt relief is only up to a certain point, and then uh, any extra, any extra benefit, um, you will not be able to take away. It's just going to wipe out your complete debt that you may or may not have. Um, so again, up to $20,000 for borrowers who uh, received the Pell Grant, only up to $10,000 for borrowers who did not. Okay. All right. Parent PLUS loans. The reason we have this slide is because we get a lot of questions about Parent PLUS loans and how student debt relief affects individuals with Parent PLUS loans. Okay. Um, if you don't have a Parent PLUS loan, don't worry about it. You could take a break. We're gonna, I'm going to spend two minutes just talking about this. Um, so the amount of debt forgiven for a Parent PLUS loan, again, if you have the correct loan type, which is Parent PLUS loan is a federal loan, if you also meet the income limits, okay, if you own a Parent PLUS loan, you can only get up to $10,000 in student debt relief. Um regardless if your child received a grant, a Pell Grant or not. Um, so, so if you have a child that received a Pell Grant and you took out a Parent PLUS loan for them to pay for their college, the maximum amount of student debt relief that you can receive for your Parent PLUS loan is only $10,000, right? Up to $10,000. You, you will not be able to, to get up to $20,000. Now, for other qualified loans that you might have, let's say you went to school, you have your own student loans. For other qualified loans, a Parent PLUS borrower could be eligible for an additional $10,000 in student debt relief. So basically you're getting $10,000 for your Parent PLUS loan and then uh, another $10,000 for uh, your own student loans. But again, you have to be a, a, a Pell Grant recipient to get that kind of student debt relief, okay? Um, 
I know it's a little bit confusing, um, but this is the good news. If your child is going to school and they take out their own loans, right? So you took out Parent PLUS loans for them. Um, they took out their own loans. Uh, later on, they're eligible, as long as they get a Pell Grant, to get $10,000 for the Pell Grant and then up to $10,000 for their own loans. Again, it's a little bit confusing. We wanted to try to clear this up a little bit because we got so many questions about it. Recapping, Parent PLUS loans, for your kids, you can only get up to $10,000 in student debt relief, regardless if your kid gets a Pell Grant or not. All right, moving on. Okay, I'm going to take you through the application process through a series of screenshots. Um, if you go to this link right here, studentaid.gov slash debt dash relief slash application, you're going to you're going to get to this page this is the first section it's just telling you you know the eligibility requirements um, who qualifies for student debt relief um, the next section which talks uh, which goes through uh, the borrower information requires your name social security number date of birth phone number email just very basic information about you um, this is way if they need to contact you they can and they can also verify your information and then finally uh, section two. Um, again, there's only two sections to the whole application. It should take you less than five minutes. Um, in section two, they have uh, the agreement terms. Um, you want to make sure to carefully go through those. And then you have to type in your name as a digital signature and then check in the box um, certifying that you understand um, all the terms of agreements and that, you know, under the penalty of perjury that everything you've submitted is correct. So again, very short application, only five minutes, uh, should only take you about five minutes and there's only two sections to it. First section, borrow information, second section, which is the agreement and the signature, and you're done. Um, once you complete the application, you should be, you should go to this confirmation screen. The confirmation screen, again, I took this when I applied, uh, I took this screenshot. Um, basically it says that, hey, we've accepted your application, um, you know, you should be things that you should expect next is um, your application will be processed um, when they can start processing them. And then uh, the Department of Education will contact you if additional information is necessary. So um, maybe there was a name change. Maybe um, you were, they need to verify your income. Uh, so they will they will contact you directly. Um, you should be getting an email from studentaid.gov um, directly for additional information if if uh, they need it. Also, once your application is processed, notification uh, will be sent to you uh, by the studentaid.gov, and your loan servicer will also notify you when your when debt relief has been applied to your student loans. Okay, so those those are things to expect. Um, all right, now I'm going to hand it off to Selena to talk about the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Again, completely separate program. We have the Biden-Harris uh, Administration Student Debt Relief, and then this is the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Selena? Thank you, Kuhn. Thank you for that great information. So as Kuhn mentioned, this is an entirely separate program. I know we have been, I've been getting, talking to a lot of borrowers about this. We do have an upcoming waiver uh, deadline coming up. I will talk about that. But yes, please understand this is a completely separate program. A borrower can benefit from both programs. So you can apply if you meet the requirements, you can apply for both programs. Just um, it's very important that you understand the terms of each program. Um, PSLF, Public Service Loan Forgiveness, was created in 2007 for um, public service employees. Um, under the program, the requirements are that you have the right type of loan, the right type of repayment plan, the right type of employment, and the right number of qualifying payments. And then if you apply and you um, meet these requirements or make these 120 qualifying payments, your uh, the remaining balance uh, remaining balance of your student loan is forgiven. Um, well, it didn't work out as planned, and after 10 years of the program, when borrowers first um, applied, there was a 99% denial rate. So this waiver was created. Um, next slide, please. So 
So last year, October, October of last year, the Department of Education created this waiver to try to remedy some of the failures of the program. And it had to do with basically um, servicers not providing the right information to borrowers, not putting them on the correct payment plans, not advising them correctly as far as what loans were eligible, not applying payments correctly, and borrowers were not able to meet the requirements. So what this waiver does is that it, it, can, it suspends most of the PSLF qualifying payment rules through October 31st. The Department of Education, as part of the waiver, will be will be looking at all previously denied applications. They will be applying payments that weren't previously applied, whether or not a borrower had the correct type of loan, if those payments were made on time. Um, and they will be just giving credit borrowers as much credit as possible to try to get them closer to forgiveness. Now, there are some steps that borrowers need to take. Um, the next slide, please. And so a borrower, in order to qualify for PSLF under normal requirements, a borrower has to have direct loans. So under traditional PSLF, a borrower has to have direct loans and they cannot be in default. During the waiver period, if a borrower applies for PSLF prior to October 31st, they, can, they are able to get credit for loans that didn't previously qualify. This includes older FEL or Perkins loans or other federal loans that are not direct loan or loans held by the Department of Education. A borrower does have to consolidate their loans, those FEL Perkins loans. Sometimes borrowers will have a mix of direct and FEL loans, just depending on when they went to school. They do have to consolidate into a direct loan to qualify for the program. Under the waiver, when a borrower does that and they apply, then the Department of Education will credit them for previous payments made on those loans, any payments made after 2007. So during normal requirements or traditional requirements, when you consolidated, you have to start your count at zero. This, this is different with the waiver and this is where borrowers are getting the, the most benefit. Parent PLUS loans are not included unless they are consolidated with a borrower's own student loans. So if you're a parent and let's say you have been working in public service for 10, 15 years and you have parent PLUS loans that you took out for your child and you're still paying on your own loans, you are able to consolidate those loans into a direct loan and you are able to apply for PSLF and receive credit, retro credit based on your own student loans. If you have just parent plus loans, you can still consolidate. However, you will have to start at zero because there are no other loans to credit. So parent plus loans alone do qualify, but don't benefit from the waiver as much as those that have are carrying their own loans. So that's something to understand with Parent PLUS loans and the waiver. Um, as far as the employment under traditional requirements, the that those requirements have not changed. A borrower has to be unemployed by a government agency. It can be on the state, federal, city, county level, military, tribal, um, military service members are qualify is they qualify. Um, and you can be an employee of a nonprofit 501c3 organization. You must be working full time or at least 30 hours a week. You can have multiple employers, part time employers, as long as the combined hours is 30 hours. Um, again, the employment after 2007 is what they're looking at. Then the qualifying payments under normal requirements, you have to have payments paid. They, they had to be on time, they had to be paid in full, and they you could not make any payments ahead of time. Under the waiver, the Department of Education is going to count all past periods of repayment, whether or not a borrower made that payment on time for the full amount due or on a qualifying repayment plan. So whether, even if you were not on an income-driven repayment plan, which is a recommended plan for PSLF, or it's the plan you have to be on actually, for PSLF, if you were on a different plan, as long as you were making some sort of payment, um, they will credit you for that. 
Also very important, certain periods of forbearance and deferment may count. So other than in-school deferment, pretty much the Department of Education wants to give borrowers as much credit as possible. Again, to alleviate some of these um, failures from servicers where instead of helping a borrower get on the correct repayment plan, helping a borrower uh, understand what PSLF is about, they were just putting them on forbearance or deferment when they were having maybe even financial hardships. So a borrower would not be receiving credit. So they will be doing this as well. Additionally, months of COVID forbearance, if you were part of the payment pause and you were with the qualifying employer, these payments will count towards your PSLF progress. That is about 30 months, 30 or so months of progress and the Department of Education will be making these adjustments automatically. Next, please. So what does a borrower have to do? First, you need to find out if you have a qualified service employer. So um, the FSA does have an employer eligibility search tool that you can use without creating an account. You will need the employer's federal employee ID number. You can obtain that from your employer. You can obtain that from uh, your W-2 form, the, your yearly W-2, or you can even Google it, which is what I do a lot. Um, once you have that information, you can enter it into this tool and it will tell you if the employer has already been qualified or certified by Department of Education. You will show you will see that it shows eligible. If it does if it shows ineligible, it may only mean that no one from that agency has applied yet. Um, but if you feel that they meet the requirements of being a nonprofit agency or a public health or employee agency, look at the requirements. And if you think that you meet the requirements, you can still submit uh, the, the PSLF form or apply for it. And then you need to find out what loans you have. And this is extremely important, not only for PSLF, but for the Biden relief that Ku mentioned earlier. Studentaid.gov has all the information. Now, your servicer will have that information, should have that information, but if you are in the process of transferring or you're right now you don't know who your servicer is because there have been a lot of changes with servicers, studentaid.gov is gonna be your go-to. Now, if you do not have an account yet, it does take a few days to authenticate the account. So you will be able to create an account, but you won't see anything. So um, just give it a day or two, and then you will be able to access your information, your loan information, and your Pell Grant information if you're interested in the previous program. You will download all your A data. You can see all loans that have been paid off, that have been consolidated. If you have any loan that says, Fell or Perkins. It will actually have the word FFEL or Perkins, and you see a balance next to it, then you know that you still have that your loan is that type of loan. Okay. Another way of confirming is if you were part of the COVID repayment pause, if you didn't have to make any payments, you know you have a direct loan, which is the qualifying loan. If you had to continue making payments, and you have what in your account is in studentaid.gov, then you have one of these Fell or Perkins loans. Okay, so that's also a way of verifying, but just download your data. You can see it there. It's very clear. Once you de determine, you find out what you have and you determine what steps you need to take. If you have those non-direct loans, then you, want, you, you will need to consolidate. The consolidation again will be on studentaid.gov. That will take you about 30 minutes to complete. You're only completing the application. The entire process will take at least a month at this point for you to get a confirmation. So what happens when you consolidate, your loans are all put into one loan. You're going to have a new balance, a new interest rate. And during the consolidation process, it will ask you if you are, are doing it or applying for PSLF. It will then ask you to pick an IDR plan, an income-driven repayment plan. There are four types of IDR plans, which it will let you select depending on your, um, on your account. So right there, it will have you select if you're doing this for PSLF, and then it will give you the options. Then once you do that, 
the loan will get transferred to a new servicer. So those loans are going to Mojila, who is the PSLF servicer. You will finish that process. You will receive a confirmation that, com that consolidation was completed or was done. And then you will wait for an answer on that. Again, as, as long as you complete that prior to the 31st, you count, you will benefit under the waiver. If you do not need to consolidate because you've already checked your loans and you know that you have all direct loans, you're good, then you just go ahead and you, you use the PSLF help tool. Again, it's on studentaid.gov. And the only thing you will need to do there is generate your application. So you will need that FEIN number to start the application there. Um, Ku, can you go on to the next one, please? Now, this is what the application looks like. And when you submit your information or you're logged on to studentaid.gov, some of this information will be auto-filled. You can check the box. You can say whether you just want to find out where you are or you think you qualify. Regardless, Department of Education is going to check them all the same. Then you go ahead, um, the employer's name and address will be automatically filled in. Those FEIN numbers are very important. So make sure that you enter those correctly and using the tool will help avoid any errors. Um, you will have to, you will be able to download and print this application. Now the deadline is October 31st. You will have to, if you use the help tool, Prior to October 31st to create or generate this application, you will benefit under the waiver. So there is no need to rush this next week and try to get your employer to sign it. If you use the help tool, Department of Education has said they will have a record of that and it should be on your studentaid.gov account anyway. And as long as you print it, download it, print it, and you go ahead and then work on getting it signed by your employer, you should be okay. It's the same with consolidation. As long as both of these actions are taken by October 31st, you will benefit under the waiver. For signatures, the Department of Education is requiring a drawn or wet signature. That means that either you download it and print it and you have your employer actually sign it and scan it, or they have to use, they can use like a digital tool where they use either a, a pad or a pen, but it does have to be drawn. So what they are not accepting are those digital signatures that already come with the font and things like that. So their wet signature, a drawn signature, that's what they're requiring. Um, who signs a form? An authorized official signs a form. So their definition is a qualifying employer who has access to the borrower's employment or service record and is authorized to certify the employment. So this can be someone in HR, personnel, uh, or your personnel analyst, specialist, um, even your manager, if they have access to your records, they will need to sign the, the form. Make sure that the dates are legible, that they're clear, and that you have the date, month, the month and date as as close as possible. You do, don't want to have any delays or denials based on that. If you are not able to get a hold of your employer, as long, you, as long as you generate the tool, it will not let you download or print the form if it says the, they can't find the employer. But as long as you start the application by the 31st, then they will instruct you on what to do. If you decide you want to mail the form because you just don't do well, like me sometimes, with the website. It is recommended to use a help tool, but you can download the you can download the actual form. And as long as it's dated by your employer prior to October 31st, it will be counted under the waiver. Again, your best bet would be to use the help tool. But if you cannot do that, get it signed. Make sure you keep copies of all your documents, what you're mailing in. Page four, I believe, has the instructions on where to mail it. This, just like the consolidation, will be transferred to Mojila, the PSLF servicer. If you do not have a Mojila account and you're not a, um, you're not with them yet. So let's say you consolidate today and then you do the help tool right away and you say, "Oh, I'm with Mojila now." No, it's going to take them time for them to get your account. So what you need to do is you will need to mail, it says mail or fax the form, I would do both. 
Again, make sure you keep a record of when it was mailed out just to be safe. Um, but the signatures do not have to be received by October 31st as long as you use the help tool. Um, a time frame on these. If you, let's say you start the process today and you just are just doing the PSLF help tool process, typically it takes about maybe a month for you to receive a um, confirmation, maybe four months on a, without the waiver for you to get a final count. Right now, it, it's going to take a lot longer. So like I said, just document everything, make sure you use a help tool. There are a lot of things going on at the same time. I understand there's a lot of frustration when people do not hear back from Mojila, from uh, studentaid.gov and they're calling everyone trying to get a confirmation of whether or not they received it. The only one that can confirm really is you. You're gonna be able to confirm that you use the tool, that you mailed it and that you faxed it. They are receiving these last minute rush of applicants, um, both for consolidation and for the application. So it is gonna require a lot of patience. Um, I know that there's a lot of questions, but they will be doing these counts automatically. If you have already applied, let's say, and you receive a letter saying that you only have five qualifying payments, from Mojila, this is Mojila telling you they have five qualifying payments. Those are auto-generated. When Mojila gets all, receives all your information, at first, all they have is what they, the information from the time you consolidated forward. The ones that have all your previous information for those pre-consolidation, those Fell Perkins loans, Department of Education is the one that has that information. So Mojila has to wait until Department of Education provides that information. They have to talk to each other to update the count. If you receive a letter a few months down the line saying, oh, you don't qualify for PSLF or you, don't, you only have 10 payments or you don't, your, your loan type does not qualify or something to that effect, do not worry they have to update, Department of Education has to update everyone's information and Mojila will be updating the accounts as that information comes in. Um, again, there's going to be, they're gonna be counting those forbearance, deferment months, they're gonna be counting COVID months and all those will be done automatically. Um, if you have multiple employers, let's say, and you can just generate at least one, just generate one of the applications, download it, print it, and then you can work on submitting the multiple uh, certifications as needed. So as long as you're in the PSLF help tool system, then you will qualify. Um, and I think, uh, is that my portion of it? Yeah, now I'll hand it over to Ku. Thank you, Selena. Um, yes, a lot of great information about the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Waiver and Program. Um, next up, I, I do want to stress this. This is incredibly important. You want to beware of student loan scams. We're seeing a uptick in this trend, um, not just uh, in California, but nationally. It's been recognized that there are a lot of student loan scams going around. Again, with any kind of government benefit that is distributed, this is going to happen. Scammers are contacting borrowers by phone, email, and mail. Um, sometimes posing as officials, using logos and et cetera. You want to protect yourself. Um, a couple of very important things. There is nothing a company can do for you that you can't do on your own for free. So there, scammers might be out there trying to charge you something for a service, uh, trying to provide you with assistance. You could do all this for free. Um, a lot of the information is available at studentaid.gov. You could go there, do your own research, and actually do everything you need to, loan consolidation, um, you know, starting the application process. You could do it all for yourself for free. Also, loan servicers and the federal government do not call borrowers, okay? They don't call you. Um, so if someone calls you trying to, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pretending to be a lo your loan servicer or the federal government, um, you should probably hang up and uh, check with your own loan, right? Go to studentaid.gov, look at your own information. Um, you can also uh, contact the student aid, uh, U.S. Department of Education um, if you were interested about any kind of information there. Um, also, you should never give out your login information, passwords, or even personal information. 
uh, especially if someone on the phone is asking for it. Um, don't subscribe to any kind of monthly service who is trying to offer you student loan assistance. Um, and finally, if you feel like you've been a victim of fraud or a scam, you could always submit a complaint to us, the California Department of Financial Protection. Uh, we have a link right there for you. It's dfpi.ca.gov slash file dash a dash complaint. Um, it's a it's an easy application. Just go in, complete the information, give us the details. Um, again, if you feel like you've been a victim of fraud, you can always submit a complaint to the DFPI. Okay. With that, um, I would like to introduce uh, the DFPI's Senior Deputy Commissioner of Consumer Financial Protection, uh, Suzanne Martindale. She's been answering a lot of your questions that you've submitted through uh, Zoom's Q&A feature. Again, you can continue to submit those questions. She's going to answer some of the most common ones that we get. Um, Suzanne? Thanks, Ku, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for uh, for your participation and for submitting questions. You know, we're doing all the best that we can to provide you accurate information, but with the caveat that for some of you that have your own specific individual circumstances, you know, we may not have sufficient information to give you a definitive answer about, you know, everything regarding your eligibility for different benefits. Um, and, you know, we understand this is legitimately confusing. Um, and there's only so much we can cover in one hour. I mean, look how, you know, how, how much time we've already taken up and it feels like we're barely scratching the surface because everything is so confusing right now with student loans. So uh, I'm going to ask, um, put up a couple questions to Selena, but I also want to, you know, emphasize that there's a lot going on right now. There are multiple efforts at the federal government to clean up the student loan mess in multiple ways. And as a result, a lot of people are filing paperwork. They're asking questions. It's just a flood right now. So if you're having trouble getting a straight answer, even getting on through on the phone to your loan servicer, we hear you, we know it's a problem. The Department of Education knows it's a problem as well. So unfortunately, you know, it, it can feel like we're, we're telling you to hurry, 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 get your paperwork in. But in some cases, you may be kind of hurrying up to get things in and then waiting. Uh, and that may feel frustrating. Uh, it's normal, unfortunately. So it's normal, but just be prepared for that. Um, so what I do want to uh, make sure that we're going over one more time is the importance of the deadline on Monday for the PSLF waiver and who needs to worry about that. And so I see a question from uh, from Chris here about do you you know do you need to be on an IDR plan, an income driven repayment plan to qualify for PSLF? Um, to what extent does the 1031 deadline matter to someone who maybe, for example, did a couple of years in public service but wasn't in the right repayment plan? Can they take advantage of the waivers, um, Selena? Uh, yeah, so yes, they can, they can. So IDR plan is um, different than the loan, the actual loan, which is more important. That's what's going to really determine what action a borrower needs to take. A, a repayment plan, as long as you were in any repayment, uh, sort of repayment, if you apply for PSLF prior to 10 to October 31st, Department of Education will be credit crediting that. So what th this borrower really needs to find out is what type of loan they had. That's going to be most important. So yes, an IDR plan is the PSLF plan, but they want to know whether or not they had direct or fell per or Perkins loans. And that's going to determine really the, the rush and if they need to consolidate before October 31st, which is the important um, the important thing to do. Great, thank you. And so I think we should also talk a little bit about what's gonna happen after October 31st. Uh, so the waiver, which again, kind of is sort of ignoring most of the usual nitpicky rules you have to follow to get credit for your periods in public service, that is ending on October 31st. However, the public service loan program still exists. And actually yesterday morning, the Department of Education announced that they're going to be doing some account adjustments to people in this category next year. They're gonna do a one-time audit 
of everybody who has been trying to get public service loan forgiveness, and they may also be giving people some additional credits toward PSLF. Uh, but so, Selena, so just want to let people know what should they expect, you know, after October 31? Um, is there anything else that they should be trying to do after October 31 if they're trying to get public service loan forgiveness? So if they've already applied, then really the only thing they would do would continue certifying their employment if they're still in public service and they haven't met the 120 months, um, continue certifying, um, submitting those ECF forms, which is the same, though, just for everyone's information, the waiver application, the PSLF application, the one I showed, it's the same one. It's not going to change. So you will be using the same one. Um, and Department of Education will be conducting automatic adjustments. So the only people really that need to take any sort of action or worry or, or just take any type of action, not even worry, are those people with those Fell Perkins loans because um, the program will continue. So if you haven't been in public service for the entirety of the 10 years, um, you're maybe at six or seven, then it, with some periods of forbearance to firm in there, the Department of Education will automatically be doing those adjustments and giving everyone credit as much as possible. So as I said, they will probably, borrowers, they're just starting the process, may not really get a final count until early next year, um, just because of how everything is going. That's why it's just important to at least generate one application on the help tool. No need to um, rush to try to get these signatures in by, by Friday. They are really... Um, just this recent announcement is just going to do great things for the program and give borrowers additional credit. So continue to certifying and um, just staying in touch on studentaid.gov and with us. Great, thank you. And I've seen obviously there there are always questions about loan consolidation. You know, do I need to care about it? Should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? Should I consolidate my loan? by itself, which you can do, you can consolidate a loan with itself. You don't actually have to consolidate it with a different loan. The point is just to convert it into a direct loan that then gets eligible for more benefits. That's really what we mean when we say consolidate. You could almost say convert the loan, uh, but also there are some questions. Uh, and, and again, your individual circumstance is going to be important in order. So we don't, there's no one size fits all answer to the question, should I consolidate? The, you know, the particular facts and circumstances of your situation are going to be important. And so anyone who has questions about consolidation, um, you know, we may need to take those offline and you can contact us to, to get more, um, to get more feedback based on your specific circumstance. But I do want to note that people are asking for the folks who need to consolidate the loan in order to take advantage of some of these debt relief options, what order should they be doing things in, right? Because should you be consolidating first? Should you be waiting? There's been a couple of questions about that, Selena. So how would you advise uh, people in terms of the order in which you should be doing all this stuff to try to get access to the expanded debt relief? Right, so in to the Biden relief, you mean to the... What should people expect if they're trying to get the Biden relief and or mm -hmm. public service loan forgiveness? Because in both cases, you may need to be consolidating your loans. Right, right. So if you are, um, I think for someone in that situation, I would advise to do the consolidation for, look at the PSLF. So look at your, and again, everyone's situation is different. If let's say, for example, let's say you only have, you have under $10,000 of, of your balance and you qualify for the relief and you're a public service employee and you've only been working five years. If you qualify under the debt relief, you have your direct loans, then there's no need. You may not consider PSLF. It may not be for everyone. Now, if you're someone that has fell loans, those older loans, you've been in public service for 10, 15 years, and you have a higher balance, and you can certify pretty much the entire 10 years after 2007, you've been in public service, and you're thinking, well, which one do I qualify, PSLF or the relief? If you need, if you have fell loans still and you need to consolidate, then you're able to do so prior to October, on October 31st or before, but preferably pr prior to. Um, but be aware that if you do consolidate right now into those fell loans into direct loans, you will lose eligibility for the Biden relief, the 10 or 20,000. Now, every situation's uh, every borrower situation is different. If you have a very high amount, 
and you will lose out on the 10 or 20,000, but you're well on your way in PSLF, it might be something worth considering. Um, some borrowers say, borrowers say it's a hassle to get this signature. If you have a very high loan and you've already put in your time and you do have to take this step to consolidate and to just get start the PSLF help to and create the application there, you can do that within a day. Yes, you will lose eligibility for the Biden relief, but that wouldn't cover your loans anyway. So it really is something that you need to look at almost strategically. Um, the consolidation will help you as a PSLF applicant, even if you're not at the 120, but you have those older loans because of these, all these adjustments that they're making down the line. So if you had periods where you weren't paying and you said, well, I wasn't paying for one or two years um, because I was on financial hardship or they put me on, on deferment, those are the months that they're trying to count in. And I think those are the people that are going to benefit the most. Um, also, parents that have those parent plus loans, you look at your parent plus loans, and if you consolidate with um, with your own loans, you'll get gain eligibility for PSLF, but you may lose eligibility for the relief. So you need to really look at your situation and just look at what's going to really get you to forgiveness fast fastest. Um, consolidation is priority for those that have a long time in state service or public service and have been paying for 10, 15, 20 years. It's gonna help you for PSLF, these adjustments that they're making. If you lose out on the 10 or 20,000, you'll have to determine whether, you know, that 20, 10 or 20 was gonna cover you anyway and really sit down and look at your loans. But um, consolidation is a very, it's something to really look at and consider, but it can be very, very beneficial, especially for borrowers that have been paying for a long time. Great, thank you. I'm seeing some kind of similar questions about sort of concerns about, you know, submitting paperwork and, or if you're certainly if you're PSLF, you know, you might be getting moved from a different service or over to Mohila and, might not be able to create an account right away or see your information. Um, so just what should people expect while all of this is happening in terms of, particularly with Mohila, this new servicer that is now taking over all the public service people? Yeah, I mean, it, they're going to expect to have to wait, really, like I said earlier. Um, I just, uh, if you are doing all this this week or even uh, last month, if you did the consolidation, submitted, mailed out your form or faxed your form, you will not hear from them. You may have not heard from them. And that's pretty much what is happening because they are getting, a, first of all, they acquired all the FIA PSLF loans that were people that were already in the program. They received all of those loans because all the loans were transferred to them. FIA left the, it's leaving the student loan industry basically. So they have those to deal with. And then now they're dealing with all the new applications, the consolidations and the applications coming in. I do get frustrated emails. I haven't heard from them. I submitted August 24th, August 25th. That's typical really, even during normal PSLF uh, procedures. That's why I said, make sure you're using the tool because that's going to be a, an official record of you applying for both consolidation and the studentaid.gov and the, and the PSLF, the actual some generating the application. If you're mailing or faxing them, just make sure you keep those documents. Um, let's say four, five, six months down the line, which is the expected really time to get an answer. And they say, we didn't receive anything. Then at that point, you have a problem. Right now, if you're not hearing from them, it's, it's really what's happening. And as Suzanne, as you said, the Department of Education is aware of it. Mojila is aware of it. I mean, they, they know the frustration. So just be patient, I think is is um, what I can tell borrowers. DFPI does not have, I don't have access to borrowers actual information. I don't have a back way access to Mohila's account. So I can't give you any updates. Really um, just be patient, please. <laughs> Yes, uh, that is unfortunately what we're having to tell people because it, they're just everyone is slammed. Um, so I saw that there was uh, one person who was wanted to double check. So the PSLF program, including the waiver, that is separate and distinct from the larger Biden Harris debt relief. So there are people who may be eligible for both, 
yes. right? And so, uh, do you? So should people be applying to one first over the other? Should they do them at the same time? Just let's reconfirm. What should people be thinking about if they're interested in both debt relief options? Yeah. So if you have, let's say, all direct loans, and you know you qualify for both, then you can apply for both. Um, the only you can apply for both if you you can actually get the only thing that the debt relief will do will be lower your balance and change your payment amount when you if you start once you start repayment um, and actually the debt relief would probably be applied faster so the only thing it won't preclude you from uh, it won't uh, disqualify you from PSLF so if you have like all direct loans right now and you're in public service you can actually qualify for both. The debt relief application is simple. As Ku said, it takes less than five minutes. You could apply for that and then continue on with PSLF, continue certifying. It, it's not going to disqualify you. So they're not going to look at the debt relief at the, if you receive 10 or 20 and say, oh, this person no longer qualifies for PSLF. They will still, you will still continue. The only thing would be for, again, those borrowers that have to consolidate. There's a little bit more things to consider, but if but a borrower can benefit from both. And I think one thing to say is the limit on the relief is a 10 or 20,000. PSLF does not have a, a limit for forgiveness. So it's the remaining balance. So if you have 10, 20, whatever it is, that's the difference in the in the amounts. Thanks, Selena. Thank you, Suzanne, for um, moderating the q and I know we had a lot of fantastic questions, still getting them. Uh, so feel free to continue to submit them in. We're going to answer them as we go. We do have a couple of final slides to go over. Um, <clears throat> so some very important student loan reminders. Again, I know we've talked about this a lot. The student loan forgiveness waiver deadline is Monday, October 31st. Um, the student loan forgive the public sorry, the public service loan forgiveness waiver deadline is October 31st. The public service loan forgiveness program will continue on. So even if you don't have 120 payments, maybe you only have three payments or maybe you only have two years of uh, public service um, underneath you, you could still apply for the waiver um, and get into the program. Uh, now, the other thing is new changes, as Suzanne has said, new changes are coming. Um, you want to stay up to date about the public service loan forgiveness program. It'll tr what they're trying to do is get more people qualified for public service loan forgiveness. So stay stay tuned for that. Um, also, student loan repayments start back up in January. So um, the pay repayment pause ends December thirty first. Payments uh, for student loans will start back in January. You want to make sure you update your contact with your student loan servicer and also studentaid.gov so that they can contact you about your new student loan, especially if you apply for student debt relief. Um, obviously, your student loan amount will change and your payment may change as well. So again, update your, con your, your contact information um, when you can. If you have loans that are in default, um, you want to be very aware of the Fresh Start program. I believe they're going to be starting that up uh, early next year. So we have a link there um, that you can click on and read more about it. And finally, please subscribe to the DFPI's newsletter. We have a monthly newsletter where we uh, include updates about not just student loans, but things that are happening around, especially California. We also have um, you know links to our and information about our upcoming webinars and events. Um, and any other consumer alerts that we send out. So please uh, consider subscribing to our newsletter. Finally, uh, we put this slide together. It's got a lot of great information, resources for you for more information. First of all, this first link here is a web page to the DFPI's student borrower uh, resources. Um, it's dfpi.ca.gov slash back on track. Again, the website has... Um, a bunch of different links to upcoming webinars that we have going on, a lot of different resources, as well as a list of government, uh, nonprofit, and uh, student aid groups that provide assistance to student borrowers. So please check out the website, um, get more information, help yourselves. We also publish all of our webinars on our on our YouTube channel. There's a link to it. And um, yeah, I'm not going to get too much into it, but again, these are all the links we share for individuals who email us who have questions. It's great. It's a great 
place to get started on your student debt uh, assistance journey. And finally, Selena Damien, uh, the DFPI student loan of Bud person. Here is her email address. Please feel free to contact her if you have more questions or need help. Um, and finally, I want to say thank you. Thank you for taking time to watch our webinar. Thank you to our panelists, Delina, uh, uh, Selena Damien and uh, Suzanne Martindale, who helped answer questions, and my staff members. Thank you for joining us for the webinar. And please take care of yourselves. Um, take care of each other. Goodbye.